¿Qué onda, Ikeros? ¿Cómo están? Bienvenidos a Kick Blue Review. En esta ocasión tenemos un programa bastante, bastante especial porque tenemos a un par de invitados de lujos. Uno va a ser como mi compañero, como host, para entrevistar a nuestro invitado eh, principal, que es Jay Barlett, que él es uno de, los, de, los, de las personas que han hecho un documental de Nintendo donde tuvo que recopilar la mayoría de los cassettes de Nintendo en 30 días, que se llama Nintendo Quest, y la verdad es que cuando lo vi fue algo increíble. Entonces, para tener primero a mi primer entrevistador, eh, compañero de lujo, les quiero presentar a uno de mis mejores amigos desde toda la vida, y obviamente también vamos a mencionar a otro de mis amigos, porque si no se va a poner celoso, pero quiero darle la bienvenida a Javier Rodríguez, que nos está acompañando, y estoy muy contento. Entonces, vamos a ver un poquito de quién es él. ¿Cómo estás? Bienvenido. Bien, aquí, perfectamente acompañado con mi hija, Mariana, Hola. a.k.a. Zelda. Ah, muy bien. Eh, no te escucha porque yo traigo los audífonos y gracias por la invitación, mi querido Pablo. Y sí, literal, dice que somos amigos de toda la vida porque nos conocemos como desde los 5 o 6 años. Más o menos, David, en la primaria todavía jugábamos fútbol y después Nintendo. <ríe> sí, y, y veíamos cómics y nos volvimos geeks. Y nos volvimos geeks, que es algo como bastante, bastante común para un chico noventero, ¿no? Pues sí, 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 una, buen, una sana costumbre se le llama. Claro, claro, claro. Y pues, pues bienvenido, hermanito. Ya tenía muchas ganas de colaborar en algo contigo y este, este programa creo que se prestó como anillo al dedo para tener a un invitado de tu, de tu calibre, ¿no? No, no, no. El que, el que tenemos es, es mucho más. Ya presenta al buen Jay. Claro que sí. Bien. Eh, les voy a presentar a Jay, que es nuestro invitado de lujo, y les voy a presentar exactamente cómo es lo que, cuál fue el proyecto que él estuvo desarrollando hace algunos años. It started with a simple concept. One man, 30 days, buy all the Nintendo games without using the internet in any way. Boom. There's no cheat codes, there's no game genie, there's no extra lives. Some way, somehow, he'll succeed at what he wants to do with this. This journey is going to be incredible. I'm going to literally go across the country. There are precisely three things he's passionate about. Star Wars, rock and roll, and video games. And the big boss at the end of the game is the ticking clock. If he doesn't beat that, he loses a chance at a dream. I think the collecting of the games, I think will be the easier part for him. I'm going to get to see all these amazing game stores, all these different types of people. Regardless of whether he gets all the games, it's just going to be this massive game loving. It's just going to be fun. And then we started asking ourselves why it was Nintendo. Why did we pick Nintendo over any other game company? Because I think that's the system everyone can relate to. Everyone loves the NES. For a period of time there, Nintendo was a word used to describe video games in general. Every game they came out with really had a level of success to one degree or another. And you didn't just play for three or four days. You played for weeks, sometimes months. Think about Mario and Zelda and only being limited to that space. So everything had to be so melodic. These are cool items that document historical information. If someone were to show me a library of NES games in a file on their computer, I'm not impressed. If someone were to show me the artifacts, that's what matters. Anyone can take a picture. Again, I'll say it, man. Life is too short to be doing something that you don't want to do every day. 
The NES is the system responsible for the industry for what it is today. That's the system everyone can relate to. Everyone loves the NES. Why don't you show me some of the games you have the world record on? Well, I have it on Zexon, Yarrow's Revenge, Star Master, Star Voyager, Skiing. I guess games on every one of these roads. Hubert, Pitfall, Laser Blast, Kangaroo, E.T., Chopper Command. That and of course the favorite, <laughs> Dragster up in the corner. <coughs> Well, Jay, here you are. Hello. <laughs> welcome. Or, or, I should say thank you for having me. Not welcome. Um, you know what? I haven't seen that trailer in a long time. Yeah. Man, that, that was a while ago. I look a little different now. <laughs> well, you don't look very different. Javi, your mic is off. Sorry, I was telling you if it make you like goosebumps. <laughs> oh yeah it's i mean that that film to this day that was the first one we did um out of the stuff that we do and even to this day it's i think still probably my favorite that we've done um i mean that was that was a time that was uh i think we were shooting around 2014 for that and that was just before here in north america all the uh, fake carts started showing up, all the bootlegs and all that stuff. Yeah. You know, so when you're buying, you're buying these NES carts. Uh, now you have to open up the board and take a look at it. That's just when that stuff started happening. So we we shot just in time, so we didn't have to deal with a lot of that kind of counterfeit stuff. And, and tell me, Jay, um, what got you to do this this Odyssey? Like, what what got you inspired? Because I saw the documentary and you said you were on a crossroads in your life. So what can you tell us about that? Uh, I mean, I was, I was at that time, I was very much a homebody. I, I didn't travel much. I didn't go out of my comfort zone. It'd be like two hours here and there uh, away from my house. But um, it was just a point where I was working at a retail job and uh, uh, Rob, who, who's the writer and the director came up to me and he's like, I want to, when I create a documentary on collecting, I'm thinking about featuring a few collectors and they're going to, you know, the camera crew is going to go around and kind of watch you do your thing. You know, go to your comic stores, toy stores, game stores. Um, and then we kind of went back and forth with, with the idea. I mean, it was interesting, but I didn't think it would have made a good film. So then we kind of narrowed it down to just one person and video games. And that's sure. where Nintendo Quest came from. That's so it was... 2014, right? Yeah, yeah. So, Whoa. Jay, let's introduce you to Javier. I know you, you met him outside the studio, but oh. uh, for, our, for our friends here in the audience, I want to let you know that he's one of the pioneers in Latin America for Nintendo. And he, he was working since he was a child. And obviously, when I presented the, this documentary to him, he was very excited to, to know about it. I mean that's that's amazing, Javier. That's uh, like we're talking about a bit backstage. The '90s. I mean, you couldn't have come in at a better time, right? Yeah. I mean, that, my favorite. That's actually funny that you say you started in '95 because that's my very favorite year for video games is 1995. Okay. Yeah. How old are you, Jay? 48. You're 48. I I'm almost 40, but it's yeah. uh, as you told uh, a great uh, time to play to start playing because my generation all the 40s uh, uh, yeah. and down they're very happy because as you were telling us in your documentary everybody loves nes and that's yeah that's a, a law a law in, in in mexico canada america everywhere everyone loves this console but what makes it so special for you um, it was so special that I remember a time, uh, like Patrick Scott Patterson says in the documentary, that my mom used to say, are you playing Nintendo? So I would have a Sega Genesis, the 2600 from Atari, all that stuff. But she would call it, are you playing Nintendo? Instead of, are you playing video games? That's how big Nintendo was, right? It was took over the word video games. Um, the li I would say the library, what the console did for the history of video games um it 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 saved the video game industry was dead in the 80s it was completely dead 
after Nintendo ET. came in. <laughs> yeah, after Atari and ET and all the there was no there was no seal of quality. There was no kind of copyright. It was just the Wild West. So someone would bring out a, a Space Invader clone, and then ten other companies would do it. So the the market, especially for Atari, got flooded very quickly with counterfeit games that were just garbage. They, they uh, would even so, uh, machines like arcade games, and they added some some levels to keep them interesting. Right, yeah, and the arcades were were doing great because you couldn't get graphics like that in the home, right? So arcades were pretty uh, viable up until I'd say almost the two thousands. But um, I would just say the library of games for Nintendo, the history of each game. Uh, Shigeru Miyamoto is the greatest game designer in the history of video games, in my estimation. So combined all that together with perfect timing. I mean, they marketed the NES in North America as a toy. They didn't even market it as a video game because people people didn't want anything to do with video games. Yeah. Wow. How old is that? That is from 1994. I think so. Yeah. In Mexico, wow. you, we used to have uh, like the Nintendo Power. Right. Uh, right. We had here uh, a magazine called Club Nintendo. It started uh, December 1991. Yes. So that's part of of the magazine it, we, yeah we had in canada here something i think it was called nintendo fan club it was it was very small there was only about five or six pages so it was smaller than nintendo power but i remember having a membership to that too yeah in fact uh, nintendo power and club nintendo over here they used to work together so right. they they can share information and games and everything so that's that's the chance that we had to uh, meet uh, as i was telling you uh before the this stream uh, to all all the people in in in, 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 uh, in that was working in nintendo uh, yeah. starting the 90s uh howard you said you met howard lincoln that that's that's huge I mean, yeah, Howard uh, Lincoln, Peter yeah. Main, Gail Tilden, Leslie yeah. Swan. I, that's and amazing. Much, I mean, sorry, go ahead. And, and also Shigeru Miyamoto. <laughs> oh, you did when, meet when, when, when he was awesome. not this rock star. That if you go right now, well, not not, not today because E three it's cancelled for this year. But uh, when you were at E three in 1995, he was walking like a human being. Now yeah. you can't uh, approach to him because yeah. there are like eight guards, a, a bodyguards. Oh, yeah. So it's it's impossible. Yeah, I mean he really is um, one of one of the originators, right? I mean he created the, the most successful franchise in history, a multiple <laughs> Zelda and Mario, right? So he's created a ton of that stuff, Donkey Kong, and uh, yeah, I understand. He's like the Beatles, right? He's just untouchable yeah. at this point. Yeah, the <laughs> of video games. Yeah, yes. there you go. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Hey, tell tell me, uh, Jay. Uh, I, when I was uh, watching your documentary, it's amazing because you Thank have you. to synthesize and and get like a summary for one hour and a half, more or less. But how many hours did you film for this documentary? Uh, I think the first cut was four hours. Um. We we cut out a lot, and I mean a lot. Are you guys familiar with Rob McCallum, the the writer director? Yes. Yeah. Okay. We're familiar so, because he's a, one of the protagonists of the of the documentary. Right. If you go on Rob McCallum's YouTube page, um, he's put up the the what, what he calls the real Nintendo Quest, which is everything uncut. So you get like, I think they're half hour bits, but it's all like five, six hours where I'll go into a store and it's almost like the raw cut. It's really good. So he's finally put that out. So you can see a lot more behind the scenes, a lot of stuff that we had to cut out just to uh, time constraints. Right. I mean, no one wants to see a four hour N Nintendo movie. I mean, maybe we do, but <laughs> the average person doesn't. Right. Don't you dare. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can watch it. I have no problem. You can. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, and what was like, uh, well, the most difficult cartridge that you had to find for this documentary? Obvi obviously, it's a stadium events, but tell us a little bit, a, a bit about your experience with that cartridge and what's the, because you never mentioned how how much did it cost you? 
No, we don't mention cost in it. Um, and we do that for a reason. Sure. Be because we wanted the, the, the film to be timeless. Sure. So when did you guys discover this film? What year? Uh, I discovered it. It was uh, last year. Sure. October, okay. I guess. So I 2021. 21. Yeah. So like seven years ago. Right. And it came out in 2015. So the prices that I paid would yeah. be very different than now. And it would kind of be a little silly. So we decided ahead of time not to put uh, the price of anything on the screen. Just so you know, Little Samson is rare. You know, Stadium Events is rare. You know, Bonk's Adventure is rare. That's never going to change because there's only a finite number of carts left. You know, so um, I, I forgot the question. I went on a rant. <laughs> yeah. But what was the difficulty of getting that cart? Because I saw yeah. you were negotiating with a guy like for four thousand dollars at the time. Because, but you didn't yeah. know that that it was an original, and there was trust issues over there, and that you wanted a cool story for for this cartridge. Yeah, I did, I, and uh, I mean, Josh is. I mean, we've spoke since. I mean, he, he's a he's a good guy, but he changed. He kept changing the terms. Sure. Uh, of the deal and uh it just didn't feel you know in your gut when you're doing a deal and you just feel like it's not right uh yeah i mean you have to listen to that right so i, I just listened to it i'm like this doesn't feel right anymore i don't want to do this so um i sacrificed maybe not finding another one but i mean he wanted us to fly to florida and it's like we have a crew of six i mean we can't just <laughs> fly to florida with the camera crew do you know what i mean like we're not a big hollywood production so it fell through but i would say the most difficult one would it would be it would be stadium events for the, the sheer rarity of that the the ntsc one yeah um that bonk's adventure and uh little samson as well the guy that helped you find it Doth, he was he was like amazing for for your quests right which which guy sorry uh, I think his name was Todd, the guy who who helped you get the the card. Oh, Todd! Yes, yeah, he, yeah. I mean, we went to his house. We reached out. We did a social media blast when we were shooting, saying, "Hey, you know, we're going through these cities. If anyone has a cool collection or any NES games that they want to maybe part with, let us know." And Todd reached out to us. Uh, we didn't know that he was such a elite collector. I mean, his collection is incredible. Yeah. And so he reached out and we went there and uh, him and I just became really close and he had two copies of stadium events and he said he was thinking about selling one of them, but not just yet. So that's the first time I go when I get bonks and little Samson. Um, and he said, but he said, if, if I'm going to sell it, I'll let you know. And that was, we shot in the summer. I reached out to him in February the next year. And I said, have you given it any thought? And he said, yeah, I think I'll part with it. So that's when we do the shooting, like eight months later and went back. Sure. Javi, do you have another I don't want to be an, I, I don't be, I don't want to be an a-hole, but I have a little Samsung over here. It's a used one, but mm -hmm. I know that it's, uh, it's price. It's, it's for crazy and collectors and yeah. all the people that loves NES games. Oh, so it's it's amazing to 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 know that this game is part of the culture and the collectors and everything. But Jay, I, I want to ask you. This was like my first question uh, after Pablo told me that we're having this little great interview with you. But what was the biggest challenge? Not speaking of a game, but on the documentary. Oh, that that's a great has a great question, Javier. Uh... There's, there were so many. One of them is the, the biggest misconception is that I had 30 days, which I didn't. I think I had about 18 because like I was telling you guys backstage, I was working a regular job. So I had to, we had to schedule the shoots in between my work. Sure. So I only ended up really having 18 days. We started the clock and no matter what happened, there was only going to be 30 days, even if we only went out five days. So that was challenging. But I would say the most, challenging part of it uh was going into each store picking up i don't know let's just say donkey kong 3 
Okay. Having that in my hand, seeing it for $50 and, and thinking, okay, we're going down south to the States. We still have a lot of stops. Do I risk putting this back to save more money down the road? So every game I picked up, I had to really weigh, first off, if I was going to see it again. And second of all, if I might be able to get it cheaper. That's the dilemma of any collector because yeah. once you, you let go one piece or uh, one action figure or something like that, then you need to buy it like, for three or four times its price. It's happening yes. right now with Marvel Legend and, and the Haslabs Sentinels and the and the Galactus and all that fig all those figures. Yes. Sir. And with Star Wars. Yeah, so it's that dilemma of um if I put this back, am I gonna find it again? I I would say Javier, that was probably the hardest the hardest thing. Okay, and that was my first question. It was like, Oh Jay, you have to tell me about that. <laughs> <laughs> so what what I'm hoping is that when you guys watched it for the first time, that I, I'm going to say this to anyone that watches it. I hope you put yourself in my position, not as me, but you put yourself in my position where you kind of go along for the ride with me and kind of say, oh, that's a good decision or that's a bad decision or maybe what you would have done differently. I hope people do that and they kind of play along when they watch it. Yeah, okay. That's, that's And Jay, you had the opportunity to meet like many Nintendo legends, like the ones that ha that hold the record Guinness for being the best player in the world. What was that experience like? Oh, it's it's a, anytime I, I meet someone um, who's he done something exceptional in in life, I think it's incredible. Um, Mason Kramer at the time, he's huge now. At the time, he had the point pressing record for Mario 3. That's getting, I believe it was the most points per level without dying and finishing the game. Wow. So he would mathematically calculate how to get the most points off each turtle. And it's far beyond my comprehension. I, I have nothing but respect for speedrunners and world record attemptees because it's insane. The amount of discipline you need. Um. So becoming friends with him is great. And just being able to go and, and sit down beside him and watch him play. And as he explains it, I think it's amazing. And we got to meet Bill Mitchell. And I mean, people have their opinions of Bill, sure. But still getting to meet at the time, he was the Donkey Kong world record holder. And if you guys have ever seen King of Kong, A Fistful of Quarters, which is still one of my favorite films, um, he's a big part of that. That's amazing. Okay, okay. Jay, and what was the, I don't know, like the happiest comment that you received for your uh, your documentary and the worst comment that you received? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, so we, we did a convention well, where we were, we were doing signings and stuff like that a, a year after it came out. And there was this... Uh, there's this couple boyfriend and girlfriend that came to our booth and she actually drew a picture of my dog that passed away during the filming of Nintendo quest. So she drew a dog, a picture of my dog Spencer with all these Nintendo carts and gave it to me. And I, I teared up. I was like, wow, that's amazing. Somebody drew a picture of my dog. So that would be my favorite thing that happened. Um, the worst thing uh, I watched a review of the film And uh, someone just said that they wanted to like kick my head in or something like that. They just said it was the worst film ever. And I remember at the time watching it with my girlfriend and we were laughing. I was like, wow, this guy really hates me for some reason. But there you go. I think he was jealous or something like that. <laughs> I don't I don't know. It was a it was a you know a YouTube video game review show and they just said that they hated the film and it you know it was staged and They, they hope one day they see me at a con because they're going to give me a piece of their mind and stuff. And I, was, I was just, wow, dude. Like, you've got a lot of anger. <laughs> People is crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit, yeah. They're just games, dude. Chill. Just, they're just games, man. Like, we just made a movie. If you don't like it, that's that's totally cool. <laughs> yeah, totally get it. Uh, Joy Jimenez says, Javier is the best guy to talk about Nintendo with you guys. I, I try because I have to improve my English. <laughs> And Jay, 
tell us a little bit about the DNA of a collector. How, how do you describe when you're a kid enjoying your toys and then you become someone who is like a safe keeper for all these relics? Uh, well, that's very kind of you to say. I'm just, I'm just a guy who enjoys this stuff. I'm by no means an expert. I've never claimed to be. I just love it like you guys do, right? So um, I think I remember... It, it was around the NES era. I think it was when Super Nintendo was coming out here, which would have been 1991 in, in North America. And um, everyone was going crazy. The launch titles were Pilot Wings and Mario World. And then Final Fight by Capcom came out shortly after that. Um, and I remember everyone just going crazy. They took their NES. They were taking their... Uh, atari 2600 and just selling it and getting rid of all that stuff and i remember just saying to my friend well what if you want to play mario 3 again sure. and he's just like oh i'm never going to want to play that old game with those crappy graphics and to me it was like i mean one of my favorite bands is the beatles right so it's like they're from the 60s sure there's been newer music of course but i still want to go back and listen to the beatles right so i i look at it like that where with video games and cinema I want to preserve that. So it's like, yeah, Mario 3 might not have as great a graphics as Mario World, but it's still a great game. Just like older movies from the 70s, you know, aren't as great, I guess, technically as movies today, but I still want to watch them. So I never, it never really felt right for me to give this stuff up. Um, I, I mean, I like, like everyone as a kid, I mean, I, I sold some stuff. Of course I did. Right. And traded away stuff um, that I regretted, but for the most part, I wanted to keep everything for that reason, because down the line, I just somehow knew that I would want to play these older games again. Okay. I know. And you're telling us that, that the NES is the best console ever. Well, but, well, <laughs> but yeah. What do you prefer? Uh, um, I, I I just wanted to uh, talk about uh, oh, uh, like the console like that, not the ga uh, the game the the way you play the console. Do you prefer a Famicom or an NES? I have a Famicom, but unfortunately, I don't have a power supply for it. Now I, ha I have played Famicom games, but I'm not really familiar, um, which is really sad. I know you can get emulators and stuff like that because there's a ton of games that never came here. Um, also, I'm not a fan of... I, I actually like the Famicom controller better, but I don't like how the cord is so short. <laughs> like, it's attached to the, the console. You can't really pull it out far. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah and, and tell me, Jay, a little bit about uh, your, other, your other collections because in the documentary you say... Uh, Jay is passionate about three things. Rock, Star Wars, and Nintendo. What can you tell us about that passion? That's my buddy Glenn. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, my age would dictate that I, I've... I'm old enough to have seen all the Star Wars movies in the theater. The first one, I don't really remember. I was two, but I was taken to it, so I've been told. It counts. Um, Star Wars has just been uh, such a big part of my life. There's so many life lessons learned from those three films, those six films, however big you choose to expand the world. Uh, I just love it. And it reminds me of my mom. My mom is no longer with us. So it just really cements that bond with her. Um, same with video games and same with toys. Um, I wouldn't be here without her and her just supporting all my crazy things that I wanted to do with my life. So, yeah, it's really, really her. Um, toys and, and music are my other two passions. Uh, I can't live without music. I need, it's like air to me. I need it to live. You're so a super, I play every day. Sorry? Uh, you were a super fan of Foo Fighters, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah they recently lost... Uh, uh, on Instagram, they lost the drummer Taylor. Yeah, and it was yeah. for for us. I mean, we we were seeing Foo Fighters um, in 1996 when they were playing to people like two, three hundred people on a Wednesday night. Uh, like they were always big because Dave was in Nirvana, sure. but 
they would do the, they were doing little clubs they weren't doing stadiums so i think i've seen them 29 28 or 29 times now um yeah. but yeah that was a that was a big loss for for me in march definitely yeah you uh, you were telling us jay uh, two of your passions star wars and video games which is your favorite star wars game on video oh, games oh my favorite star wars game that's a good question i really used to like the old republic the the mmo that ea mm -hmm. made in 2011 that story that bioware made ea put it out i loved that game because i i was a really big world of warcraft fit, like player for a long time so that game was great um but if you're going to take away the multiplayer oh man i used to like the jedi academy games okay yeah okay okay why was that It's a good question. I don't know because they're pretty cheesy, weren't they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just want to understand you. <laughs> yeah. They, I, I liked the idea of, I, again, Javier, you know, you know about all the Star Wars stuff from the 90s, right? But the, there was not a lot of Star Wars in the 90s that wasn't books. It was just novels. We didn't have really anything else. So when a video game came out that had nothing to do with the skywalkers and had these new characters i was all over that because i was all about expanding that world the, the universe yeah yeah so kyle katarn was the protagonist he wasn't particularly interesting but it was cool because it was different you weren't luke right you weren't fighting vader it was just different okay okay here, we have, here we have a question with uh or with alex Villanueva. Do you enjoy today's games like online games or battle royale and stuff? Yeah, I was a, a big fan of Fortnite for a long, long time. I played that with my buddies a lot. Um, really loved it. I, I used to play it on PS4. And because Fortnite, I haven't played it in a while. So if this is incorrect, let me know. At the time, you were playing against everybody, right? So PC players, Xbox players, everyone was kind of together. And uh pc gaming for a game like that is of course far more accurate so I even upgraded my computer so i could play it on the pc then i had to teach myself again but yeah i love fortnite i love the idea of battle royales um what was that one PUBG? i used to really like i like i like how it makes you feel it's very it makes you tense it's very it's almost like you're in a real war because it's like one hit you're dead you're out of the game that's it it's sure. a really cool idea Jay, I have like uh, a question that has been walking uh, around my head. Yeah. Was it hard to have the Nintendo name or brand in your title of this documentary? Because Nintendo is very jealous about their brand. We went through the proper legal channels. Yes. Um, it wasn't that difficult because I have a few. I had a. I still have a connection for someone who works with Nintendo. So we went through her and got our lawyers connected with her. And they were fine with it. Um, the, the thing that they dismissed right away was we tried to get Miyamoto. We tried to get an interview, anything, like a phone with a translator, anybody. But they wouldn't even, no, you can't even come close to him. I'm like, okay. <laughs> It's like going to church. You have to go to church to talk with God. <laughs> yeah. It's impossible. Yeah, I mean, we we tried our best to get uh, Shigeru Miyamoto, but they just wouldn't. And we tried to get, I believe, Reggie Fizame at the time. He was still with Nintendo, but th he declined as well, and that's fine. Jay, at the end of your documentary, um, you left us a little bit of a cliffhanger over there. Like, uh, what other console may we have? Uh, wait, may we go for for the next time? Yeah, so we'll never say never on making a sequel. Uh, the problem is the cost in creating one of these uh, and the retro video game market now, the prices are crazy. Um, and I got to be quite honest. So with Nintendo Quest, it's all my money that I use for these games. Right now, I, I don't know if I could do it. It's so expensive now. But let me ask you guys this. What game system would you want to see in a sequel? Super Nintendo. For Super? Me. Javier, yeah. what would you pick? Uh, I'll, I'll pick uh, Super NES. Super NES. That's good. Yes. Yeah, that's, we did a poll, and that's the one people wanted to see the most. Or it could be Game Boy. 
Game Boy, yeah. No, not, not, not many games, but... You, do you remember this? Of course I do. <laughs> uh, this is when when the movie of Street Fighter came out with uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme and Raul Julia. Yes, there was, and ming -Na Wen. And ming -Na Wen. There was this premiere in, in Mexico in a very famous movie cinema. And I gave this this cartridge to my to my friend Javier to get to get signed, and Jay Tavares signed it that he was portraying Vega in the in the movie. Wow! And in the back we have the signature of Ming Na Wen, who, who was Chun Li. Amazing! Yeah, that, that, that's, that's at that great. time we're we're having the TV show, so that's the reason we received uh, all these uh, stars uh, for the Street Fighter movie. There, there was, there was nothing like when that game. I, that that's amazing, and I like the, I like the movie. I even like the game. I get a lot of crap for that. It's, but... it's, it's, it's like pizza. You can, you can go wrong with, with cheese. Yeah, exactly. Um, when when Street Fighter II: The World Warrior came out on Super Nintendo, that's when I was frequenting the arcades almost daily. I I wasn't a, a school guy. I, I skipped school as much as I could. I, I didn't like it. So I'd often go to the arcades with my buddies, right? And uh, it, Street Fighter 2, we would sit there and, you know, you would challenge somebody and then you would have to wait in line. And then when your turn was up, you got to fight the guy who was the current champion. And then Nintendo announced, sorry, Capcom announced that uh, Street Fighter was coming to the Super Nintendo. There was no Genesis Champion Edition yet. It was just on Super Nintendo. And I lost my mind. I'm like, oh my God, we're actually going to get a home version of, at the time, was like the greatest game ever. And yeah. uh, I remember getting it for Super Nintendo and it was $100 here. Yeah. Yep. I still have it. It was 100 bucks. Practicing at home and then going downtown, thinking somehow that my skills would have got better. I don't know if they did or not, but it was a special time. Great game. Who, who was your go-to player? Guile. Okay. Guile, 100%. How, right. how much did you pay for these arcades in, uh, over there? Because in Mexico, we had to pay one peso for the token so you can play. But how much uh, did you pay? A nickel, a dime, a quarter? It, it was a quarter back then. Um, now, yeah. there's a few arcades left here, and, and you basically... you you. You but pay... not in, in, in Chuck E. Cheese, right? <laughs> no, no, nothing like that. No, it was a quarter back then. So, like, I would go in there, and my mom would give me $10. And I remember I'd go to the, the guy with, with the, the coins, and he would give me a roll of quarters. And I felt so rich, guys. I would just walk around with this roll. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to be here for, like, an hour. I'm the bad guy over here. Yeah, I was the badass. Before phones, man, I had a roll of quarters. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, you have to tell us, Jay, how many games and NES games do you have in your collection? And how many games do you have for uh, the collection at all? Uh, NES, I probably have about 20 now. Uh, so the collection that is in the film, I sold it to to get a condo, to be quite honest. <laughs> right? Um, games I got, I must have almost probably about a thousand. 900, 1,000 games. But I collect uh, for every single system. I love every system. I think each one is important for video game history. So as much as I love Nintendo, I, I love everything pretty equal. I, I found many videos that GameCube collections are going like up like crazy, and it's getting very popular, that, that console. That always happens. So that generation was Xbox, PS2, and GameCube. Um Again, there was a time I, I was working at uh, uh, EB Games back then, and when the 360 and the PS3 came out, everyone was coming in and dumping all that stuff. PS2, Xbox, I did the same thing. I hung on to all that stuff, man. I'm like, I'm not getting rid of like Final Fantasy X. Are you crazy? Like, I'm not trading that in. Yeah, I might want to play that again. And so the the same thing happened. So I'm betting in like five years. 360 games will go through the roof again and ps3 games all that stuff will be worth a ton again okay jay now 
we were talking about all the documentary, all about you, your atmosphere, everything. But you were telling us before the stream, your favorite NES game is not the best, it's not the popular, it's not uh, uh, the common favorite game for everyone. Right. Yeah. Why do you love the uh, Legend of Zelda 2? Zelda 2, uh, primarily because when I first played it as a kid, I didn't understand it. It was confusing to me. I didn't understand leveling up a character. I didn't know what that meant. And no, I didn't read the book. I, I could have. But um, I liked how the game made me feel. It made me feel a lot of fear. It made me afraid because it was so hard and so punishing you would get so far in any of these palaces. And if you lost your three men, goodbye, do it again. And I just, and the boss fights were so hard and, and you have a sword this big for some reason, it's like a little dagger. Yeah. Um, it's really the difficulty of the game. Uh, and then later on as an adult, I, I finally finished it. Actually the year after we shot, I made a point of sitting down and, and finishing it because I never had before. Um, and now I understand leveling up, you know, of course you level your sword first and then your, your life and stuff like that. So I just like the challenge of it. And when you get older, you can understand when Link re uh, was received by the girl in every town. Oh, come over here. So I give you life. So what? Yeah. <laughs> when yeah. you're here, it's, oh, she's helping me. She's healing me. Uh, and yeah. right now it's, whoa. You're like, well, you don't see what's going on behind closed doors. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. Great. I, I, I think uh, Legend of Zelda 2, it's, it's a great game. I, I really love Uh the this uh, saga this uh, all the Zelda games uh, in fact uh, well i have two kids uh, the uh, the older one has uh, nine years oh he's nine years old and he is almost finishing the, that game because wow i i wow. know of course i'm a retro guy and if they want to play FIFA 2021 or 2022, they have to play retro games too. So he's almost finishing uh, the Lino Zelda 2. What's your hint or your recommendation or your tip for my kid? For Zelda 2? Oh. And don't get scared about uh, the, the fighting uh, against your shadow. Oh, well, that's easy. Everyone knows how to beat that guy. You just duck in the corner and can keep attacking he runs right into you but my kid doesn't know yeah <laughs> he has I, to learn <laughs> that's true you're going to be cruel and not tell him aren't you <laughs> they they have to 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 get mature in video games uh, i would say the the biggest tip i have is you learn a lot about yourself playing this game don't give up Yes. Um, because when you finish this game, when you when you defeat Thunderbird, and I think Thunderbird is the most challenging boss in the game, when you defeat him, it's it's the feeling is insane. Like your heart is jumping through your chest. It's so intense. Um, I just I just find that you don't get that kind of thrill with modern gaming. It might be my age, apart from the you know the Fortnite and stuff like that we we're talking about. But that's because other players are hunting you. I mean, sure. strictly a one-on-one -on -one experience. I don't think you get that kind of challenge anymore. Okay, okay. Uh, I really love Zelda because Zelda, the first Zelda, uh, well, it was like the golden cartridge. Oh, my God. Oh, so you can save all, all your, uh, what are you playing. It's amazing. You but it was the first back. game. Yeah, it's, it's, my, it's the first game I finished all by myself. So yeah, I, I was great. like very proud, and after that, uh, I, I I get the Zelda two and just start playing. Uh, well, I start playing uh, for Super NES and N sixty four, but Zelda it's um, I, I don't know how to say it. It's the best thing that I have in my life. Wow! Yeah, that's. I mean, that, they don't make games like that anymore. I don't think there's developers like that anymore. Let me rephrase that. I don't think developers are allowed or given chances like they were back then. I really believe that. I think everything is about fourth quarter numbers with these big companies, with EA and Activision, and everything is so safe, and it's the same. One question. What do you think about Neil Druckmann? 
About whose story? Uh, Neil Druckmann, the guy from The Last of Us and Uncharted, because it's a great, great story, great, uh, great two video games. I'm not yeah. too familiar with what, what you mean. I know the game. I just don't know what you mean by. Well, uh, my recommendation: you have to play The Last of Us. Yes, oh, the, yes, the, I've, I've played the first one. Yes, sorry. Uh, okay, <laughs> uh, the creator, the the guy behind the the scenes about that game, it's uh, Neil Druckmann. I had the okay. chance to, to speak with him, and I think wow. the ideas and all the uh, all that he has in his head, I think he could be the next great developer uh, i don't know what the title you want to yeah. to give it to him but i think he's a genius too a younger one but a genius yeah that game is that game is fantastic i haven't played the second one i love the first one um i used to think that uh kojima was also on that level but he's a little out there he's very uh like Kojima games are are out there for me. So like Metal Gear, I used to enjoy Metal Gear, and it got a little crazy around the fourth one. Um, but he's up there as well. But I just I don't think we're ever gonna see another Miyamoto. I mean, the opening of Zelda, you hit start, you put in your name, you hit start, boom, there you go, do what you want. That's insane. So of course you go up and get your sword. You don't have to. There's guys that beat it without even getting the sword, which is crazy. But um, yeah, I mean the fact that you can technically go anywhere you want in that game. I mean that's that was so far beyond its time. It's crazy. It's like the first open world or sandbox. Yeah, it has to be. It has to be. I I, I never think about it uh, like the way you're you're doing it. It's a great uh, quotation. Yeah, I don't I don't know the order of the palaces specifically but i know that you don't have to go to the first one you can i think you can go to the second or third one first i think pretty sure and i mean that's crazy that you can do that you can go around and just look for all the bottles as soon as you get the candle and ah, it's a wonderful game yeah actually in your documentary one guy actually tells you that tells this that they don't do games like they used to do it like if you pitch a world where you are going you're you're gonna be the personal the the first character killing turtles and stepping into mushrooms and all that stuff it wouldn't fly today i mean that that really goes with everything today i believe you know with movies too i mean when's the last time they took a chance on a movie it's just remake or superhero movie, remake, superhero movie, right? Nobody takes any chances anymore. So that's James, and he works or worked on Call of Duty. I don't know if he still works on Call of Duty, but he did back then. And he's right. Like, if you were today pitch an idea to Activision about a plumber who eats mushrooms, gets bigger, shoots fireballs, I mean, they'd be like, okay, yeah, see you later, bud. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and what's your opinion about we saw the change? We we saw video games in eight bits, and now we're we're seeing things like the Unreal Engine, like yeah. the new generation. What do you think? Like video games are are going to go from here? Uh, to follow history, they just get obviously more realistic. I don't think VR is the future. Um, there was a time when PS4 you know came out with the virtual reality headset everyone thought that that was the future that's just not going to happen you're not going to play a game like grand theft auto for 20 hours with this thing on your head there's just you know your brain will blow up you know there's no way i think it's going to continue to get more realistic uh graphics don't impress me anymore they haven't impressed me for a long long time i don't care about that i want a game that has substance some of the yeah. greatest games, some of my favorite games, the graphics aren't that great. World of Warcraft, it's nothing compared to today's games. It's very cartoony, doesn't look realistic at all, but it's a great game. It plays well. I think uh, the, the the future is just more realistic, but that doesn't necessarily mean better. Yeah, because in the God of War games, like the second game is one of the best. Yeah, there. it is. Yeah. So I <laughs> okay. I understand. Okay, Jay, you were telling us about the video games and the evolution, but I don't know if you read or l listened about the 
the news that Xbox had yesterday that no. they will okay let me explain you because I was it was like I'm blowing my mind sure you you can buy a new Samsung TV for 2022 or 23 I, I don't remember but you will play if you had like an Xbox but playing in your smart TV you don't need a console you just need a controller you can also play with these headsets so you can play everything what do you think about this evolution that you can play a console without having a console i think it makes sense with the way technology is going uh, i'm not a fan of that i i very much want a physical item being a record or a movie or a game because then i'm in control of it um exactly exactly so you know you're, you're seeing like really cool innovative stuff in cinema like netflix netflix is great but whenever they decide to take off pulp fiction or whatever your favorite movie is they decide to do it you have no control over that i don't like that uh, and if i buy super mario brothers 25 and i want to lend it to you guys i can do that if you buy something digitally, I mean, you you can here and there, but I just prefer physical. Totally. Okay. Do you prefer like the booklets that you received when you play an NES game? I, I, I miss, I miss <laughs> because that. you can get an, a PDF right now. It's it's not the same taste. It's not the same. Yeah, exactly. You're holding it. See, you're touching it. It's like if you guys read comic books, you can smell it. You can smell it, and there's nothing like an old manual smell. Or, or like a new controller, that's another great smell. But like, you can read a comic book on your iPad, but it's not the same as, you know, that's why I don't like game, like reading video game news online. It's not the same. Yeah. Like, I like having the magazine in front of me, right? So you actually can touch it. I don't know. We're human beings. We're meant to touch things, right? It's just the way it is. That's a yeah. great game. Fantastic game. This is a great game. Yeah. Yeah. And and Jay, tell us a little bit about um, in, in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game. You said like Turtles in Time. It's a great game. In your opinion, what's the best Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game? The arcade game, the Konami okay. arcade game, one hundred percent. There's nothing like that game. It's fantastic. It was the first of its kind and then konami reused it for x-men for simpsons they just reskinned it which is fine but that first turtles game is incredible yeah because you could play with all your friends with the with the four players that was amazing and how smart is it of konami because that game is so cheap that there's times when you die and you can't do anything about it so you're just putting in quarters after quarters right pretty smart yeah yeah which did one? The Kawabonga collection. Pardon me, sorry. Did you get the Kawabonga collection that came out like last year? No, uh, no. I, I have the um, I have the One Up Arcade cabinet for Turtles. So that I have. You guys have seen those, right? They're like three quarter yeah. size arcade games. Wow. Yeah, I have a bunch. I have a bunch of those, and they're not they're more expensive and i know you can get arcade games with a thousand games and all that kind of thing but i like to support the actual company so i have a bunch of those in my game room upstairs that's amazing Obviously. and what what was which one was your another favorite arcade game after street fighter after uh tmt and tmnt and anything capcom did uh capcom in the 90s was just magic uh so strider final fight um those games were incredible uh if, as far as street fighter goes i think super no mine is this yeah one. super turbo uh, x-men was fantastic yeah x-men was great um mega man i never played the. there was a mega man arcade game correct yes i never but, played it. but it was like weird it was weird yeah same as there's a mario kart arcade and i've never played that either and i was always hoping nintendo would bring that on something but they never did i think it had pac-man in it too because namco made it yeah 
well nintendo has also the luigi luigi's mentioned with like the shotgun yeah so you have to, it, it's kind of weird i had a, the chance to play it, i don't know like four years ago but like mario kart is not the same it's weird is it weird i haven't i've never played it um i, I really want to try that one though but uh yeah so arcade games were there were so many great ones i loved all the old beat em up ones like we were saying uh like x-men and uh I used to like Michael Jackson's Moonwalker by Sega. I loved the arcade game of that. Super Turbo. Or no, that's just Turbo. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's a Turbo one. Moonwalker. Oh, wow. We're getting old. <laughs> Moonwalker, man. Yeah, that was multiplayer. too. So you could have four, I think two or four Michael Jacksons. I think it was two or four. I can't remember. That was a great game. Yeah. And, and Jay, please tell us a little bit about I, I know that you didn't only do the, the, the documentary, but you also did a series about the collections of the action figures and Marvel Legends and all that stuff. Can you tell us a little bit about that and He-Man and all that stuff? And G.I. Joe, you are a great G.I. Joe fan, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So our spiritual successor to Nintendo Quest is called Action Figure Adventure. You can watch it now on Amazon Prime. Uh, it's basically the same idea where I travel around across the country and across the states to collect these rare toys. But instead of keeping them for myself, uh, we auction them all off and they go to the children's hospital here in, in my hometown, which yeah, is great awesome. because all of us who are watching it get to go on this ride. We get to enjoy the toys, but then the toys do something much bigger than just sit on my shelf. They actually go to... To help kids um so it's an organization i've been working with for a few years so we kind of wrote that in um instead of just me going around buying toys for myself it's going to a better cause that's, have you ever amazing jake did you, you ever think i don't know when you used to be a child that you can sell an nes game so you can buy a condo <laughs> no no it sounds crazy no, uh, yeah. we're in 2022, <laughs> and this this has nothing to do with, uh, this has nothing to do at all with my love for video games. So I, I've been criticized in the past by people say, "Oh, you sold your your NES collection, so you 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 don't really like games." It's like, no, I do, but you have uh, something that you can take and turn it into you know a better life for yourself. So that's that's what I did, um, and it's all it's on film forever, right? So I'll, I'll always have that. But, you know, it's like Todd Todd said when he sold me stadium events. He's like, I've had it for a while. I'm going to pass it on to you. You enjoy it for a while. And I had it for a good couple of years. And I looked at it every day. It was in that glass cabinet, like in the film. And I just would stand there. And I'd just be like, wow, like, there's like less than 200 of these in the world. And then after a while, it's just like, okay, I think it's time to let it go and let someone else enjoy it. When you have something of that magnitude... Sure. I think it's important to share with other people who enjoy it as well. Yeah. What would you say that it's your prized possession in your in your collection right now? Oh man. Video game wise? Uh, no, no, no. It, everything. Uh, in everything. Uh, the, uh, I, I don't know, an autograph, when you met someone, where, if it's on a statue, if it's an action figure. I don't know, it, it, your price possession, like you put the most value in it. Probably the stuff you can't replace. Um, the, the couple times I got to hang out with Dave Grohl, the photos of that stuff. Um, yeah, I got to meet Mark Hamill once, got a photo with him. That was like huge for me, right? So you never get to meet Mark Hamill. So stuff like that. <laughs> Who's that? Um, Mark Hamill's Luke Skywalker. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you're joking. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Sarcasm. Yeah. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> well, you never know, man. And then I look at all your pop culture movies. Yeah. I'm an idiot. Yeah, yeah. It's like the, the voice of the Joker. And... Yeah. He was in this, this small little indie film called Star Wars. You might have heard of it. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> you got me. That's a good one. Yeah, what about you, Javi? What's your price possession in your collection? I don't know. I I had um, 
an N64 um, golden controller uh, that they didn't sell. It was just like a gift that Nintendo gave out to uh, all the journalists in, I don't know, it was like uh, 1997, 1998, but it's also signed by um, Shigeru Miyamoto. Wow. <laughs> wow. I haven't seen that in, in, in person, dude. And, and you won't, and you won't. It's it's an, at a secret location. It's it's like Area Fifty One. I don't know how, how to say it, but it's most, most like that. Uh, well, my prize possession is uh, when I met Stanley. Uh, yeah. There was this one contest uh, when the first Iron Man movie came out, and I won a contest, a photography contest. And I won a life-size statue of Iron Man, like the one you have for, for, for that mouth. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, produced by Mokul Mannequin. And then that, yeah. 10 years later, I got the opportunity to meet Stan Lee and he signed it. Whoa. That's, yeah. That's yeah, great. I, yeah, that's all three of our... Position. All three of our picks are, are pretty pretty great. Uh, I think you guys got me beat, though. I mean, meeting Stanley, I never had the opportunity, unfortunately. Um, but that's incredible. And, of course, Shigeru Miyamoto is... Uh, and, Jay, you will enjoy this. Oh, wow. <laughs> Beautiful. Was... Now, d tell me that you have that printed out and framed in your home somewhere. Yes, I had... I okay, have, good. like, four or five pictures with uh, Miyamoto since 1995. This is the last one, I guess. It was, like, 2017. It was uh, for the launch of uh, Nintendo Switch in New York. Oh, and he wonderful. wasn't, uh, like, uh, invited, like... Uh, I don't know for this event, so I was. So uh, he... I was talking with all my friends, and I have to go to the catering. I'm getting very thirsty. Uh, I want to eat something. Do you want uh, anything? No, I'm okay. Okay, I went alone, and there was like the catering. It was like outside the, the ballroom, so it was connected by two doors each. Uh, sideways, yeah. and the one opened when I was drinking my my water. And it was uh, Ejenuma. There was Shigeru Miyamoto. And, and um, uh, Miyamoto-san, may I have a picture? Yes, of course. Da, 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 da. I had my two, three pictures. I went with my friends. Here's a bottle of water. And fuck yourself, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they were like, I, we didn't know that. I, I didn't know either, but I had this luck. So when you're when you're standing there and the, the doors open and you see him come through there, what do you what goes through your head? Are you like it oh was God. like uh, uh, the brightest light ever, like slow motion? The, the, yeah. yeah, slow motion. Yeah, the doors of the heaven opening <laughs> like that for me. <laughs> for me, for Javier Shigeru Miyamoto is uh, one of the biggest uh, yeah. persons ever existed because it's my passion because video games. But, but he's a creative, he's uh, intelligent, smart, he's a genius for me. So yeah. for me, Miyamoto is a very, very important people. And it was like, okay, I had my picture. One, one more for uh, for my collection. For the uh, road. And my friends were very, very jealous that fuck yourself blah, blah, blah. you know the, those are those are the best times and i've met uh that's the first time i met dave grawl was it was just we were behind this little club and we were there like way too early there's nobody there we didn't know what to do and their bus just pulled up there's nobody else and they just got out and we're just like holy crap like those are the best times right when you don't expect it and you just you see them and it's like wow and that's great too because you're such a Zelda fan. So that must have been uh, yeah. amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I want to ask you, Pablo, like meeting Stan Lee, what was a stupid question, but what was that like? Like, what do you say to Stan Lee? Well, I have a, a, actually a fun story with Stan Lee because when I knew he was coming to Mexico, he was coming to a convention. So I tried to get the, mo the most autographs I could. So I, I, I bought three. <clears throat> You know, in, in conventions, they sell everything. So when I got the autographs, I said, I'm going to meet him. It's going to be great. But then he started canceling uh, some conventions because of his health. 
So oh. I was a little bit nervous and all, and all that stuff. But when I knew that he was coming, I wanted to give him a gift. So I was I, I started thinking about what to give him because he he's a man who has it all, right? He, so, he has it all or he's created it all, right? So yeah. pretty much. Yeah. So I, I was thinking maybe a, a bottle of tequila, but with the face of Spider-Man in which all art or something like that. That's cool. But but no, he he he's an older man. He he doesn't drink anymore or something like that. So I remember the story that he used to tell that uh, his his mother gave him a typewriter where he wrote Spider-Man and the Fantastic Four and Avengers and all, all his first stories in the 60s. So um, one time he had a fight with her with her wife, Joan. Mm -hmm. So he she grabbed the, the typewriter and she smashed it to pieces in the floor. Oh, no. So I remember that story and I went to, uh, on eBay trying to search for that exact model of, of typewriter. He was It was a Remington Noiseless of 1929. So the funny thing is Destiny, uh, I found it. Wow. And it was very expensive. So I bought the machine and I took it to him. So at the first time when he saw the machine, he was like, like a, a little bit flabbergasted. Like, wow, what? that's crazy. Like, what do you want me to do with this machine? Do you want me to sign it or something like that? Yeah. Right. I, and, and I said, no, no, Stan, this is a present for you because I know about your typewriter. I know you, you lost it a, a long time ago. And I, I just wanted to say thanks be, be, because of everything that you have ever done for the collection, for, for the collector's community. So he was very excited. He took my hand and he shook it. And and he was like very excited and he started to turn the machine and, and he started to say, well, let me tell you a story about this machine. Like uh, when I used to press this, this uh, letter, it used to get stuck, so I I needed to to put it back in, in this way and, and that. And the model that I had, it was like the 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 portable model, and this is the desktop. But you you brought me like many many memories, and thank you very much. Wow. And and, and then he said like, "What do you want me to sign for you?" And I gave him the the Iron Man arm. And his hand was like a little bit shaky. But when he was about to, to put the signature, he just got steady. And he did it with a lot of care, too. Because you know how signings, signings are. Like, yeah. next, 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 high stand, next. Yeah. And, and he, like, gave me, like, five minutes of, of his time. And for me, it was, they, they say, don't meet your heroes. And, and for me, that was like my dream because my hero was actually way beyond what I expected to be. Wow, that's that's a great story. And uh, yeah, I mean, he's, you guys, like both your heroes are like, I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. I mean, I'll, I'll throw George Lucas in there and there's three right there. Right? I mean, that's that's incredible. That's an incredible story. Same with yours, Javier, like. I'm jealous. I'm very jealous. <laughs> no, Jay, we're we're just like we see you as as a fellow collector, as a fellow geek, as a fellow fan, mm. as 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 a person who has followed his dreams and managed to conquer them. So we we just respect you just as much. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, it's always a pleasure to to meet people like be so passionate to be uh, this uh, with this uh, word uh, I don't know how to say it like the easy word that you have when you're talking about uh, all the issues when, when you're getting this quest to to spend the time the money everything for these six people and share it to us I really appreciate that thank you very much Jay because it's great to as, as Pablo uh, was telling you 
it's great to to know uh these kind of collectors that they're passionate about it i found that the the biggest obstacle you'll face is yourself honestly people care too much about what other people think what other people say uh i'm guilty of it too but if you put all that aside and i even remember like telling my mom we were gonna do this film about this and she's like didn't think it was a great idea and i still did what i felt was right and that's all you have you know you know in your hearts and people can say what they want about what you want to do but you just have to follow what you think is right yeah stan stan lee said it many times like if you really have an idea and you think it's good you really should pursue it and don't let like some that's that's the way he said it don't let some idiots tell you otherwise because maybe you're depriving the world of something special and he's absolutely right i mean you can't argue with stanley i think most of the time the negativity you get from people is I don't want to say it's not jealousy but it's like they're afraid of their own failures you know they're afraid so they're projecting that on you sure. right when it's not they're not thinking your idea is good they're they're more afraid that they would fail so they're like oh don't try this because you're gonna fail you just because gotta they, yeah because the best ideas are always the different ones yeah and i mean you just you just gotta do what you feel is right and um yeah, the, the response for this particular film has been 99% positive, except for that one review I told you about earlier. But everyone is, is they really like it. And I think uh, what you see is what you get. You know, we don't come across as any kind of Nintendo experts by any means. We're just fans of the console, fans of video games. And we, we love road trips, you know, going to different stores and seeing how each store is completely different from the next one. It's It's such a fun time. But also the storytelling is great. You need to tell Rob that he did an amazing great editing the film and, and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. He's uh, Rob is a very talented writer and, and director, and he's a good friend. Um, yeah, he's he's changed changed my life completely because um, he just came to this idea. He came to me with this idea. He didn't really ask me to do it per se. He wanted me to be involved, but. Then we kind of worked out the kinks and then he's like i don't know do you want to do this he's like you know you're you're crazy enough to try something like this and i thought about it for about a day because it's a yeah. pretty big commitment and then i'm like yeah let's do it let's do it a whole day a whole day well i mean it's uh, when opportunity knocks right i mean the worst injustice you can do to yourself is to close that door as long as you you're not hurting anybody and and you you have the means and capability of doing so i think you shouldn't let fear rule your life and i did for a long time like i said i didn't like to travel i didn't like to go anywhere and now it's the opposite i just i love being out so you know with covid hitting that's the worst thing that could have happened because yeah. we couldn't we shot season two for action figure adventure last summer and that was scary but we still went out there and did it right what has been the, Which, the best oh. figure that you found in, in the action figure hunting? We went to, uh, I hope you guys will check it out. It's on Amazon Prime. Uh, I think you guys will like it. Um, I, we I have, have to check it. because it, it's a different library in Mexico, different, but yeah. it's always a VPN. Yeah, well, you didn't hear that from me, so I didn't hear that either. So um, I, I was mute. I, I was um, try, talk. <laughs> yeah, we went to uh, Steve Sand Sweet. Uh, his collection is called Rancho Obi Wan in California. He is the curator and has the biggest Star Wars collection under the Lucasfilm banner. And we got to see the uh, rocket firing Boba Fett prototype figure. That never was released to the public. So in that got uh, retrieved from the from the stores. Yeah. So for Star Wars, um, if you mailed in, there was a sticker that came on a lot of the packages that said, "If you mailed in a few proofs of purchase, you would get sent this Boba Fett figure that shoots a rocket." And Boba Fett, Empire Strikes Back wasn't out yet, so Boba Fett was this new character nobody knew anything about. But it was uh, cool. 
And what happened, unfortunately, is Mattel released um, some of their Battlestar Galactica figures that also shot rockets, and a poor child got it lodged in their throat. It was a shock. I, I, yeah, I believe they they passed away, unfortunately. So Kenner right away is like, okay, we got to take this isn't going into production. We'll make Boba Fett, but the rocket won't be able to come out. So the prototype figures, there's only a handful, and we got to see those. I mean, that's yeah. that's toy history right there. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a total like a, a holy grail of that. Absolutely, of- yeah. It, it would never was produced to the public. There's been some reproductions that you can buy to kind of have it, you know, but they never, never went into production. Oh, that's amazing! That's amazing. Uh, for toys, uh, I have no, no, nothing uh, about a collectible, but also the. Um, uh, gauntlet, I don't know how to say it uh, perfectly. The gauntlet for the Thundercats of Leona. Oh, when yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, his his cat claw, it's also a shield. The cat claw, yeah. thank you. Great. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I find that all this stuff, um, blends right video games, movies, comic books, toys. The, you'll rarely find one person who only collects one of them. I mean, everyone kind of just collects a bunch of everything, right? So, yeah, the power pad, yeah. Look at that bad boy. That that's a classic. And uh, the the rich the rich boy at the nineties. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember this event? Of Mortal Monday is that Mortal Monday? This is a, an event when they presented Mortal Kombat in here in Mexico. Yeah. And happy the Sheraton. Yeah. Yeah, we had in North America, it was called Mortal Monday that Acclaim was pushing. So it was TV commercials. And that was the day Mortal Kombat came out. And we skipped school and went to go rent this game, not buy it, but rent it for. We got it for Super Nintendo at first because the the uh, characters were bigger, the color palette was better, but it had no blood. So then yeah. we went back and rented the Genesis one. Uh, which had smaller sprites, so the characters were smaller, but it had the blood, so obviously that was the one we wanted to play, right? Yeah, totally. That was the point of that game, right? Wow. What do you think, uh, dear Jay, what do you think about the evolution of uh, different gender, uh, uh, yes, gens, uh, generous? uh, Generations? Generations? No, no, no. no. Uh, You have the RPG, you have the platform games. Oh, genres, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have to improve my my accent. So, uh, what do you think about okay. this evolution about creating new ones like Battle uh, Royales? I think it's the last one oh, yeah. that has been uh, created. So, what do you yeah. think about that? Uh, starting that you're you're a retro guy. I mean, I think it's I think it's great. Uh, and again, I'm not. I may have come off a little crass earlier on. I'm not against modern gaming a- at all. I just find it less interesting um, than, than retro games. I think it's great. I think it's when you can create a new art in an art form that has been alive since the 60s, technically, video games. Um, that's great. I think the Battle Royale is a great new genre. It's kind of like when uh, the massive multiplayer online role-playing games or the mmos came out at first that was mind blown it's like we can play a final fantasy game but together we can do these quests together like that was i wasn't going to leave the house ever again that was like the best thing ever right so that was pretty much like adult versions of playing with toys if you really think about it if you play world of warcraft with your friends it's like you're playing with toys but you're just in separate houses right it's the same kind of thing i i think uh, creating new genres is fantastic okay okay yeah because when i was uh, receiving like the idea of battle royale it's like well it's but no no it's new it's new it, it, that's that's not uh you can't play like that uh i don't know nes super nes or n64 and it was like it's a great idea i don't 
like Battle Royales because I think they're too slow. I don't know if you will want to play Fortnite and you're a bad guy. Uh, well, not a bad guy, but the worst yeah. guy ever. Uh, you have to wait like three or four minutes to start a new uh, party yeah. or a new game. I, I I hate that. Yeah, it's. I mean, there's a, it's a, it's a time commitment, and there's those times too when you drop in and you get killed right away. Um, uh, yeah, I, I can I can understand that. It's not my favorite genre. I just think I love the suspense of it uh, more so with games like PUBG because Fortnite has the building aspect to it, so you can make these big forts really quickly. I like the PUBG more, where you're just in a building and you're just listening for anyone coming up. There's just something about that suspense I really think is cool. But I like horror games too, right? So That's Resident nice. Evil, yeah. Well. Jay, it's been amazing to have you in the show. Uh, thank you for the opportunity for, for doing this interview. Really, it, it, it meant a lot that, that you were so open when, when I first uh, wrote you. Like, you were super approachable. And I just wanted to say thank you because all your insights in, the, in, in your documentary, in your collecting lifestyle, uh, everything that you shared with us today, it, it's it's been amazing. So I, I just wanted to thank you because I, I know your time is very, very important. And I just wanted to thank you because in here in Latin America, many, many people will see your show because because of this interview. And we are so grateful for it, for your time. Uh, Pablo Javier. Yeah, this has been one of the, the best interviews I've done all year. Again, you guys, you, you can just tell uh, you guys love what you do. You're very professional. You're very happy. That It's really nice. Some shows I do, people are just kind of like really down and blah. But uh, I can tell you guys are very passionate about this stuff. And uh, that's great. Keep it keep it right up. It'd be very successful. And you are much, welcome. Jay, because you're an amazing person too. Thank you. Yeah, anytime. I'll, I'll come back anytime you guys want. Anytime. Just let me know for sure. And oh. thanks to everyone in the chat, too, for, for saying hello and stuff. I appreciate that as well. Yeah. And Javi, I just wanted to say thank you also for your time, for, for all these years of friendship, for uh, being like a, a, a support for, for this interview, because I knew there was no one better than you to, to help me to tag along to with this interview with Jay. So thank you very much, Javier. And I wanted to, to dedicate this, this, this show to a very special person for your dad, because uh, you. he, he was like a very, very, very special person, not only for video games, but because he was like a huge light for all of us. So I, I always remember him with, with a lot of love. And I, I, I only wanted to, to, to put a little segment that I made for the closing of this show. And then we just say our goodbyes and you can uh, promote your, your, your lines. You can promote everything you want. You, you can say your, your social network media. And thank you everyone for, for being with us in this afternoon. So here is, here is a little tribute to your father that thank you very much sometimes i felt as my own Thank you so much. Like very special for for pretty much all the kids in Latin America. That was wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Javi, you know I love you. And thank you, guys. Uh, this is this has been Geek Review. Javi, can you share your, your social media to the, to the yes. 
Eh, bueno, ese sí lo digo en español, en Twitter, arroba GRA10, en Instagram, arroba GRA100. Perfecto, Javi. And can you share your, your social media, Jay? Yes, I can't do it as fast as Javier. That was pretty impressive. Mine's a little <laughs> bit slower. <laughs> uh, yeah, like, so, sorry, sorry. It was like no, Twitter, okay. at GRA10, uh, uh, Instagram, at GRA100. Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah, reach out to me on Facebook or Instagram, uh, just Jay Bartlett. And please check out my YouTube channel, which is also just Jay Bartlett as well. And again, guys, thanks very much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, and you can totally check the documentary on Vimeo On Demand, right? Yes, uh, Nintendo Quest, uh, Action Figure Adventure, all that good stuff. And there's also a Nintendo Quest Power Tour, which is a sequel we did, which where we go across the country and, and show the film. So you can also find that. All that stuff, I believe, is on Amazon Prime. Thank you, Jay, for your time. Thank you, Javi. And this has been Give Blue Review. Thank you, guys. Thank you, geeks. And... We'll see you next time. Thank you. Estamos en contact. Take care.